Hello and welcome everyone. It is with my great pleasure to report to you that finally, may maliit na milestone na dumating sa ating klase. YouTube has finally messaged us congratulating us for our growing community. And it's all because of you. Thanks for that love and support that you're continuously sharing with our class. Now, for those newcomers there, kindly uh, like and subscribe to this channel if you like the contents of our videos. And also to my students who haven't yet hit that bell, kindly hit that bell in order for you to be notified every single time that we are about to upload a new video. Well, it's already past midnight. Let's get down to business. For today's discussion, we will be focusing on epidemiology and public health. To continue our study with epidemiology, let's first discuss what pathology is. Pag pinag-usapan natin ang pathology, it basically discusses uh, the causes and effects of, disease, of diseases. It specifically studies structural and functional manifestations of diseases and is involved in the diagnostic phase. Pagka pinag-usapan ng pathology, basically we would like to know how a particular microbe upon entering the body, how it will affect different cells to cause diseases and what kind of manifestations will occur once this pathogen or this microorganism infects the body. Yun ang pathology. However, for today's discussion, we will not focus on how exactly this particular microbes infects and affects our body, but rather we will focus on the term epidemiology. When we talk about epidemiology, it always talks about patterns where we study and analyze distribution, uh, patterns, relationships, and determinants of health and diseases, as well as uh, different conditions present in a well-defined population. There are several focuses of epidemiology. First will be the characteristic of the pathogen. Number two will be susceptibility of your population. You have immunization status, sanitation procedures, nutritional status, your location of your reservoir, as well as the ways of disease transmission. All of these factors will be the focus of today's discussion. And... Uh, all of these things are the focus of your public health comes the time that you will be tackling public health nursing. So without further ado, let's proceed with the next slide. Let's now define several terms starting with an infectious disease. When we say a disease or how do we consider a disease to be infectious? As long as that particular disease is brought about by infiltration of a particular microorganism or rather a pathogen, it is now considered to be infectious disease. So any disease caused about by a pathogen. That's basically the definition. Next will be a communicable disease. A communicable disease is by a strict sense a type of infectious disease where it can be transferred from one person to the other. Kaya communicable. It can be communicated. It can be transferred. Another term that we are to discuss is your term contagious. What is the difference between a communicable disease and a contagious disease? While communicable disease is, well, a type of infectious disease, contagious disease is a type of communicable disease wherein uh, it is easily transmissible from one person or one organism to the other. It's highly contagious. Ibig sabihin, madaling na ipapasa. That's the difference of these three terms. Just a brief recap, your infectious disease is any disease caused about by microorganisms. And once it can be transferred from one person to the other, communicable. Now, if it can be easily transferred from one person to a group of people, that's what you call contagious disease. Zoonotic disease from the world itself, zoo, ibig sabihin, it has something to do with animals. Zoonotic disease is any disease condition that was brought about by different animals. Well, there are several uh, animals that can bring diseases to human beings and we consider them as reservoir. Later, as we progress through our discussion, we will talk further what reservoir 
R. However, in a strict sense, zoonotic disease is wherein a disease condition which is considered to be infectious is brought about or caused by animal sources. Currently, the world is facing this condition called COVID-19, which several speculations have arised uh, explaining its particular origin, and one of which is its source, like the bat. According to some uh, literatures, it originated from coronavirus that normally def uh, animals such as your bats harbors. Uh, and upon contact with human beings, these particular pathogens, or, well, for animals, they are considered to be normal microflora that doesn't cause any disease condition. However, upon transferring to us humans who are not used to having these kinds of pathogens, causes a severe manifestation sa atin. That's why it leads to, at times, severe conditions such as your respiratory syndrome, acute respiratory syndrome, as well as death in worst-case scenarios. It was also believed that the said disease was transferred by exporting Pangolins. Pangolins are an example of a rare animal that was believed to have, well, healing properties based sa kanilang scales. What I'm trying to point out is several animals, even your pet dog. If you remember uh, Nala from our previous discussion, my co-lecturer, Nala might be a source of infection. And any infection, again, brought about by your animals, even your pets, might be, is considered to be zoonotic disease. Now we define for, uh, another term called incidence. Pag sinabi natin incidence, one word should always come into your mind. And that is the word new, bago. Because incidence as described is the number of new cases of a particular disease. When we say incidence rate, on the other hand, it is the number of new cases of that particular disease divided by the number of persons at risk. Allow me to give an example. For example, a particular study have focused on studying cancer among female clients. Now, according to the study, there are, well, 30 individuals who suffered from breast cancer out of 500,000 uh, uh, 500, participants who happen to be female. At the start of the study, there are 500,000 participants who does not have cancer. However, upon the end of the study, there are 300 individuals, as per what I said a while ago. 300 divided by 500,000 will be basically 3 over 500. So that is your incidence rate. Susceptible. Sinama lang natin yung persons at risk and who is at risk for having, well, uh, female-related cancers, of course, are female individuals. That's why it's incidence rate. It's the total number of new cases divided by the number of the populations at risk. Now we talk about the word prevalence. If your incidence is the number of new bagong sakit or newly diagnosed individuals contracting that particular disease, ang ating prevalence rate is the number of total cases of that disease existing in a particular population. Period prevalence is termed as the total number of cases existing in a given population given a particular time. Point prevalence, on the other hand, is given the particular moment, sa ngayon. Let's give examples so that we won't be, uh, well, confused. Let's start with your incidence rate. An example of your incidence rate is the newly diagnosed COVID-19 patients in the Philippines as of today is, okay, uh, X number of people. That is incidence rate, newly diagnosed Today, alright? So, yun yung mga bago lang na na-diagnose na tao. That's incidence. Again, incidence equals new. However, when we say prevalence, period prevalence uh, for that matter, the total number of COVID-19 patients as per the month of June is, ibig sabihin, from the start, from the first, person who contracted the disease up till the last known person who is currently contracting the disease that will be included in your period prevalence. 
Okay? Which we will specify a particular number of people, okay? Or which we will specify particular date or month or time period. Okay? Next will be point prevalence. Pag sinabing point prevalence, classic example, palaging today. Example, as of today, the number of diagnosed COVID-19 patients are X, X number. Alright? That is your point prevalence. Ibig sabihin, as of this point. Gaano karaming tao, how many people are diagnosed of that particular, particular disease since the first person was infected up till this moment? Point prevalence. So, basing from the figure that you can see in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, that basically explains the difference of your incidence and prevalence. Prevalence is the total number. Ibig sabihin, lahat ng incidence, lahat ng newly diagnosed cases from time to time added together is equal to your prevalence. So, again, new incidence, prevalence, total from person 1 up till the last person who is considered to be contracting that particular disease. Also, nowadays, you are frequently hearing the term morbidity rate, mortality rate, as well as case fatality rate. Let's discuss them one by one. When we say morbidity rate, it's basically the incidence rate expressed in a specifically defined population. What am I trying to say? It's a ratio. A ratio uh, wherein it shows specifically how many people are infected given this particular number of Filipinos how or the particular number of population. For example, 6 out of 100 Filipinos are considered to be uh, COVID positive patients. Ibig sabihin, nag-assign tayo ng number of population to represent the whole in order for you to give a clear picture. A picture that can be easily visualized. That's morbidity rate. Okay? Next will be mortality. When we say mortality, you are to associate mortality with death. Mortality rate is the ratio of the number of deaths during a specified time period in a specified population. What am I trying to say? For example, the leading... This is just an example. This is not based from actual uh, facts, just a disclaimer. For example, uh, currently, tuberculosis is the leading cause of death among Filipinos that causes 3 out of 100... De uh, uh, 3 out of 100 Filipinos dying from TB. Ibig sabihin, pinapakita natin the ratio. We are providing a proportion wherein we are giving a picture how many people die given a specified number of individuals. So, makakapagbigay ka basically ng idea to your readers or to your listeners how many people are indeed dying based from that ratio. Pero that is just a representation. Will that be enough in order for you to understand that indeed this particular disease is deadly? For example, sinabi ko sa'yo, the mortality rate of COVID-19 is... Uh, 50 out of 100 Filipinos are dying from COVID-19. Will that uh, make sense to you na it is indeed a deadly condition? You cannot say that it is already a deadly condition. How will you exactly know if a particular disease is indeed deadly? Hanapin mo yung case fatality rate. Because mortality rate is the number of deaths on a population regardless if they have the disease or not. Ibig sabihin, pag sinabi natin, 50 out of 100 Filipinos, that doesn't mean that those 100 Filipinos had experienced COVID-19. However, 50 of whom died. Okay? Paano natin malalaman kung deadly? Punta ka sa case fatality. What is case fatality? It's also a ratio, a proportion, which shows deaths or the number of those people dying from that disease compared to the total number of diagnosed cases. Dito makikita if indeed it's deadly or not. Okay? Examples are posted in your PowerPoint. You have uh, a pandemic or an epidemic that happened year 2002 as well as 
an epidemic that happened 2012. Ah, uh, correct me. SARS was considered to be pandemic during that year. According to according to statistics provided to us, uh, during the year 2002, there are 8,098 diagnosed cases of SARS and uh, recorded number of deaths is 774. Having that data, it was concluded that the case fatality rate is equal to 9.6%. Meaning, if you have contracted that particular disease, you are to die from that disease with an approximate value or number or probability of 9.6%. Ibig sabihin, madedetermine natin kung nakakamatay ba if indeed this particular disease is deadly or not. However, another particular strain of your coronavirus well, by the way, coronavirus is also the causative agent for SARS. MERS, on the other hand, during the year 2012, was considered again to be an epidemic na nasa Middle East. Kaya MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, was also caused by your coronavirus. Approximately 2,400 or 2,494 cases were recorded and among these cases, 858 people died having a fatality rate equal to 34%. Ibig sabihin, during that time, if you have contracted the coronavirus that caused MERS, okay, that means you are probably to die approximately 34% ang chances mo to die. That is case fatality rate. As of the moment, coronavirus is still picking up. The number of deaths are also picking up. That's why we can have a conclusive result for your case fatality rate. That's why it's important for you to find this uh, particular parameters in order for you to have a clear picture of what kind of disease are you currently battling. Let's now classify diseases according to the number of infected individuals as well as the time and frequency they are appearing in a particular geographic location. Unahin muna natin ang sporadic disease. When we say sporadic disease, the first word that should always come into mind is the word occasional. Because sporadic disease occurs occasionally within the population in a particular geographic location. Which means, there will be time that this disease is present in the community or, or there will be time that this particular disease is were, well, absent in this particular community. Ibig sabihin sa Tagalog, ito yung sinasabing paminsan-minsan lang, chances lang, kakaunti lang. Okay? It only uh, takes several occasions for this particular disease to be present in a community. Why is this possible? We have this what you call vaccines, uh, Im Im uh, immunization shots, and because of these inventions, and which I consider will be one of the best uh, advancements in the field of science because indeed it prevents many uh, diseases and even deaths to even happen. Kaya nga importante sila. And because of this, immunizations, vaccines, we have some diseases that are considered to be sporadic in nature. Occasional. Minsan-minsan lang. Endemic disease, on the other hand, is, well, always present in the community. However, it varies in the number of people being affected by that disease. Minsan, the prevalence rate is high or the incidence rate is high or at times there will be uh, good days wherein the incidence rate is, well, at minimum level but never absent. Yun ang tinatawag nating endemic disease. Okay? There might be fluctuations present. Uh, however, the disease never goes away. Next will be epidemic. An epidemic disease is, well, typically an involved endemic wherein that particular disease that is always present in the, or a particular disease will now affect a great number of individuals compared to usual, relatively occurring in a short period of time. Uh, before you think about COVID-19 or any disease related to COVID-19, a classic example of this is, for example, well, I, I said example a lot of times, but again, for example, uh, it's one of a pro, uh, it's the birthday of a prominent figure in your community. Now, that particular prominent figure held a feast, and after the feast, there were reported that. Uh, there is uh, an incidence of food poisoning where uh, 
Well, fifth and David was suffered from uh, dysentery or or gastric condition or gastric upset. Okay, might that be considered uh, an epidemic? Uh, yes, it might be considered an epidemic, wherein it is not expected that there will be a sudden number or influx of patients complaining from food poisoning. Pero nagkaroon a sudden increase in the number of incidents within a particular area. And madalas, uh, most of the time, this epidemic follows a process wherein the number of cases will peak, wherein patients will go uh, day after day or hour after hour going to hospitals having patient influxes. And once it reaches the maximum number of individuals infected, there will be a downslope. Ibig sabihin, hindi na siya akyat. Once the trend goes down, it will continue. It will continue up till it reach total eradication at a particular point. That is, uh, sabi ko nga dito in my lecture, uh, the number of susceptible and exposed individuals is basically limited. That's why natural termination of that disease is expected. That is epidemic. Usually, epidemic happens where people living in a populated area, for example, cities, will now have their vacations traveling from the city going to a rural area to have their rest and recreation. However, little do they know that they might be carrying different pathogens, different microbes, which is not currently present on that particular community. They are not used to that particular exposure. Ergo, they don't have any defense mechanism for that particular microorganism. Comes ikaw from the city who will have vacation, okay, you will now be a reservoir for that particular microorganism. Then, because of the absence of natural immunity for this community, you might cause infection to them. That is the usual cause of an epidemic. Well, in order for you to further understand, let me give you several examples. You have influenza. Influenza is usually an epidemic that multi uh, in multiple areas in a certain time of the year. And I would like you to understand that influenza is mutating every now and then in a span of probably even yearly they mutate they develop resistance to previously effective medications or vaccine or shots immunization shots that's why it's a requirement for or rather a suggestion for individuals to have a regular immunization shot in order to update your immune system with the current virus that might be well uh, spreading in your community Another example will be, well, the start of COVID-19. At the start of COVID-19, it was not even considered to be a pandemic. It started to be an epidemic, wherein a particular, uh, uh, what do you call this? A particular community in China or a particular province in China was had uh, an abnormal increase in the number of persons infected with COVID-19. Don't nag-start ang epidemic ng COVID-19. And usually, uh, epidemics are named after their uh, place of origin. However, uh, for some reasons, WHO opted not to use Wuhan virus as the actual name for this particular disease because it will cause, according to them, uh, discrimination among our Chinese individuals. That's why uh, they rather uh, called it coronavirus from the characteristic of the causative agent. But what I'm trying to point out is because of the sudden influx or the sudden increase in the number of identified cases of COVID-19 in Wuhan, uh, a province of China, it was during that time considered to be an epidemic. However, if this epidemic started to be transferred from one country to the other, wherein multiple countries are now experiencing an abnormal increase in the number of persons infected of that condition, that disease is now considered to be pandemic. Ito yung nararanasan natin ngayon. An epidemic, that, uh, an epidemic case that occurs or causes a global phenomenon. WHO states that half of the deaths per year is related to infectious disease. Ganito yung mga pandemic, epidemic. Uh, well, just a fun fact. Uh, 
there was this person named well, John Snow. John Snow is uh, or pioneered a particular study during an outbreak of cholera, which he determined what causes cholera in the in a particular uh, community in London during his time. Then he discovered that it was transferred through water intake. That's why he even uh, closed or uh, well, shut the water system on that particular community in London in order for people not to obtain uh, water from the water source because according to him, the water source is contaminated with the causative agent of cholera. And because of his findings and his uh, contribution to that particular community, he was, uh, he is now considered to be the father of immunology, uh, sorry, the father of epidemiology. Yun yung naging reason kaya siya ang kinonsider na father of epidemiology. Well, going back to the statement of WHO, it is now believed that, well, most of the deaths happening all throughout the world is brought about by infectious disease. Particularly, you have there your AIDS, HIV, TB, malaria, and, well, not to mention the current pandemic that we're experiencing, COVID-19. So basically, all of those are considered to be infectious by nature, and again, it well contributes to the uh, to well a great number of deaths happening all over the world. There are several determinants whether a particular infection or pathogen might cause infectious disease to different clients, and there are three major considerations that we need to determine in order for us to understand if indeed this. Uh, infectious microorganism might cause disease. Number one will be the actual pathogen. We would like to determine the pathogenicity. Based from our previous discussion, pathogenicity is the degree by which a pathogen can cause a disease. Okay, we are now checking number one, how are they to survive and how are they to multiply, uh, multiply given a particular scenario? Because their survivability as well as their uh, rate of replication will determine how fast and and well uh, their extent that the the extent of how they are to cause a particular disease in your host dapat natin ma-determine yon. Diyan papasok your concept of your uh, capsid, your glycocalyx, and even uh, how they reproduce, cell divide, or even infect uh, several microorganisms, or organisms for that matter. Aside from that, also included in your pathogenic factor is how are they being uh, uh, transferred from one person to the other or your mode of entry. Your mode of entry will be further highlighted in your uh, chain of infection which we will talk about later on. Next will be your host factor. Aside from the causative agent, you need to check the host. What are you trying to see? Number one will be the overall health status. This is the point where in history of past illness as well as history of present illness uh, will take place. Okay? Because we would like to determine possible comorbidities present to that particular person that might contribute to his or her susceptibility to that particular pathogen. Number two is nutritional status. It is undeniable that the effect of your nutrition is uh, great in terms of your extent on how you can harbor a particular disease condition. That's why to everyone who is listening at this current uh, video class, kindly be safe. Always eat the right food in order for your immunity to be boosted para hindi kayo mabilis mahawaan ng sakit. That is part of your host Factor. Ikaw kasi yun. Next will be your age. Given the extremes of age, halimbawa, sobrang bata, sobrang matanda. These persons are considered to be vulnerable. The very main reason why during the quarantine period, only those persons, if I'm not mistaken, age 20 to 60 are allowed to go out. Because those persons are considered to have the strongest or... Uh, they they are at their peak of their immunity kaya mas malakas ang chance nila to to not contract 
COVID-19. Ergo, the policy na at this age limit will only be allowed, uh, will be the only ones allowed to go out of their houses, primarily because of the age factor. Number two will be lifestyle. Some particular practices or lifestyle practices contributes to you being more susceptible to a particular disease condition. For example, you are a smoker because smoke is foreign and causes uh, lung tissue damage, it is believed to be uh, a reason why you can contract pneumonia, tuberculosis as well because you have a low immunity and poor uh, uh, respiratory tissue integrity. You also have your socioeconomic status. You have your occupation, both of which will determine your capability to avail different medical uh, services. And that ability to purchase, that uh, purchasing power will now determine also might be a, de uh, a good determinant in how you are to deal with your diseases. That's why we would like to check this to your clients. You also have your travel history. The very main reason why okay, they are holding persons in uh, airports because they would like to examine if a particular individual indeed traveled from a community or from a country that that current uh, epidemic or a pandemic or for this matter COVID-19 is rampant para ma-prevent ang transfer of infection or para ma-prevent ang infection for that matter. You also can check hygiene, substance abuse as well as immunity. That's all of these factors are what you call your social demographic profile of your patient very necessary for us nurses in order for uh, in order for us to know the background of the patient uh, identifying several factors that might contribute to him or her contracting that particular disease and the extent on how that particular disease might infect that client because okay let's let me give a classic example uh, because of my good immunity, even though I might be exposed to COVID-19, given that I travel the particular country that uh, uh, COVID-19 is rampant, okay, because of my current immunity, I will be more protected compared to individuals probably age 70 above, 60 above, whose immunity is a little bit down. Another, for example, there is a current influenza uh, uh, circulating around our uh, uh, community okay now that my immune uh, record is updated meaning that I have just had a immunization shot I might be protected while my neighbors will not be kaya kailangan mong i-check ang immune status as well and last among our three factors will be your environment Okay, your environment as per your uh, current understanding with different microorganisms, uh, they thrive based from the temperature, pH, uh, the alkalinity, osmolality, uh, uh, climate, lahat yan. All of those factors are contributory to how or well, to the fate of your microbes, whether they can multiply or they will die depending on that particular situation. That's why environment is also a factor in which we are determining in order for us to know the extent of how these particular diseases can cause harm to human beings. Okay, laging tatandaan, heck, you have your host, you have your environment, as well as the pathogens. All of those factors plays important role on the extent of how diseases will be able to affect us human beings. Infection is said to be circulating in a chain form. What is important when we talk about chain is that when you break one part of the chain, the cycle will stop. That's why you need to understand the parts of the chain in order for you to fully, uh, to fully be equipped on how you are to combat different infectious disease. Because again, when one part of the chain is broken, it is already finished. I mean, the infectious chain is already killed. Infection will be terminated. Let's start. Of course, you need to have a pathogen or what you call the agent. 
uh, for this slide, is to, it's termed to be the germs. This might be bacteria, viruses, parasites, prokaryotes, whatever they may be. As long as they are the causative agent of the disease, it should be present within the chain. And this particular uh, microorganism will need a place to survive where they will be able to grow, replicate, and will start to infect this particular host, ang tawag natin sa kanila, reservoir. Okay? Uh, bago tayo mag-infect ng host, kailangan muna nila ng area wherein they will be able to proliferate. This, re, uh, this per, uh, person, animals, or creature, whatever organism that may be, that might harbor this pathogens or these agents are considered to be reservoir. Once we talk about reservoir, you need to understand that reservoir does not only include living beings. Okay? Pag-usapan natin sila, there are two major classifications of your reservoir, living and non-living. Among your living reservoir, you have your human. Okay? When we say carrier, it is basically a person wherein this particular pathogens has successfully colonized. Nakapagparami sila. Okay? They have increased in number. However, that particular pathogen does not, well, as of the moment, cause a per, uh, disease manifestation or disease to so that uh, client or to that person, ang tawag sa kanya ngayon, carrier, tagabit-bit lamang. Okay? Because he is now harboring that particular uh, causative agent. Now, there are several types of carriers. You have your passive carrier wherein he or she carries pathogen without even having the disease at all. No chance. Basta bit-bit-bit-bit niya lang ang, ang, ang causative agent or the pathogens. You also have your incubator, uh, incubatory carriers. When we say incubatory carriers, as you progress with your study in your microbiology, you will understand that there are several uh, life cycle, one of which life cycle of your pathogens, one of which is your incubation phase, wherein the main goal of incubation phase is increase in number, kaya incubation, maturity, that will be the uh, focus, reproduction and maturity. Next, uh, when we say incubation carriers, they are capable of transmitting diseases during the period of the incubation of microorganism. Habang nagpaparami pa lang ang microorganism within your reservoir, they are able to transfer that particular microorganism to other people. Tawag sa kanila incubatory, wherein they infect during incubation period. Meron naman convalescent. When we say convalescent, they are able to transmit Pathogens when they are recovering, classic example of which is chicken pox. That's why, that's why always remember, once a person infected with chicken pox have her, his or her uh, lesions starting to dry up, that means uh, he or she is now in the convalescent stage. Mind you, chicken pox is highly contagious at that particular phase. Kaya, it does not mean that your wounds or your itch are starting to dry up. That means you can go outside and celebrate and have a party or a mañanita. Well, it does not warrant you to have a party because chicken pox is highly contagious on convalescent stage or on its convalescent stage. Meaning, that particular person is considered to be a convalescent carrier. Okay, let's now have your active carriers. Active carriers are persons who have had the disease and have completely rec recovered. However, they still harbor or contain within their body the causative agent and have the capability to infect other humans or other individuals or organism for that matter. Uh, ang tawag sa kanila, active reservoir or your active carriers. Well, as per previously explained, animals can also be uh, reservoir. When animals place as reservoir for a disease condition, it is called your, again, zoonosis or your zoonotic disease. An example of which is your rabies present in the saliva of different animals such as dogs, cats, bats, that once they have bit you, okay, uh, they might transfer the rabies virus through salivary injection. That is an example of your uh, zoonotic disease wherein animals served as reservoir. 
Another example of your animal or zoonotic disease is your toxoplasmosis brought about by your toxoplasma gondii, commonly found on fecal uh, material from cats, which will infect uh, if infected, uh, uh, if successfully infiltrated pregnant individuals, it might cause uh, severe debilitating condition on the fetal growth, especially when exposed during the first term or the first three months of pregnancy. You also have your anthropods. Pag pinag-usapan natin ng anthropods, these are animals such as your insects as well as, uh, uh, well, different insects for that matter, that may be involved in the transmission of disease. They are termed to be your vectors. Aside from having the living, micro -or living organisms as your reservoir, pwede rin naman yung mga walang buhay. What am I talking about? Different microorganisms can be transferred through non-living things. For example, those that are being carried by air, you have those that are in soil, dust, are present in food, milk, as well as different substances that are considered to be inanimate. For example, fomites, or what you call fomites. Your fomites are inanimate objects that are capable from transmitting pathogens. For example, I do have or I am a carrier of uh, well, your uh, a particular pathogen that lives in my mouth. Now, upon drinking in this mug, I basically leave microorganisms on this particular surface. Another person will now utilize my mug and without proper cleaning and hygiene, it might be transferred to that other person through, in the, uh, through contact. Those are basically your reservoir. After your reservoir, these microorganisms should find a port of exit. This is the point wherein they will go out from the host or the reservoir. Usually, there are different portal of exit uh, through uh, human reservoirs such as your mouth, cuts, or even during your uh, fecal, uh, well, defecation, wherein your fecal material will now be carrying your microorganisms. Now, another important concept in order for you to understand sa ating chain of infection will be your mode of transmission. It is necessary as healthcare provider that we know the possible ways on how different diseases are being transmitted person to person, animal to person, or, well, from an organism to the other organism. There are basically uh, four major classification of your mode of transmission. Number one, you have your droplet method. Ganito ang droplet method. For example, I am a patient that is suffering from a disease condition that can be transferred through droplet method. The moment that I have sneezed, the moment that I have vomited, or somewhat that I have released any mucus uh, a substance from my body, it will be harboring different microorganisms. And that particular infectious droplet, because of its size, usually more than 5 nanometer, will be able to travel a little bit, approximately a meter to 2 meters in distance. And because of their large, uh, well, a little bit large size, it is now being transferred in a, in a minute distance and then finally... Uh, settling down, kaya ang tawag sa kanila, droplet method. It is usually generated from coughing, sneezing, or when, even talking. Uh, next will be your airborne method. Your airborne method is when, there is when there will be disposal of or dispersal of your droplet nuclei. Rather than staying on their drop form, it will now be evaporated and then be joined in your dust and then carried away through air. That's why it's considered as airborne. Usually, they have a size less than 5 nanometer and having a small size will enable them to travel through air. This is the very danger because previously, uh, it was stated that your COVID-19 is strictly being transferred through air, uh, droplet method. Because of that, it is necessary for us to stay, well, approximately or more or less 2 uh, meters away or 6 feet away from each other in order to prevent contact. Because these microorganisms, when they settle down, it will usually die if it really is a virus because virus does not support life in itself. Well, 
However, if now, well, multiple um, studies have shown that these microorganisms can somewhat survive through air and be carried through air. This is another danger. Once it's considered to be airborne, greater distance of transmission can happen. That's why 2 meters might not be sufficient anymore in order to protect or to stop or to cut the chain of infection. That is the importance of understanding if your causative agent can survive or can be transferred through uh, airborne method or through droplet method. Next will be vehicular method. When we say vehicle, may tagadala, may carrier. For example, you have your uh, food, water, dust, as well as your fomites, basically your non-living reservoir. You also have your vectors, which are commonly insects, as well as arachnids, bringing or carrying the, those different microorganisms that might cause disease. An example of which will be your malaria, which we have talked uh, probably during our fourth or fifth uh, installment of our series, where we've talked that Plasmodium, despite being a sporozoa, which is non-motile, because of the presence of vectors such as your female Anopheles mosquito, it can be transferred from one person to the other. Same is true with your uh, Toxo... Well, tra uh, you have your Dengue as well. Dengue can be transferred by bites of Aegis aegypti, which is considered to be a vector as well. Next method will be through contact method, wherein there are several ways in order for you to acquire that particular pathogen. You have direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. For example, I am an infected person, I have an influenza, or well, let's use COVID-19 as an example. Uh, as a person carrying COVID-19, I suddenly sneeze without anybody around me, meaning I will not be able to infect anyone because no one is proxi proximal to me. Upon sneezing, I've used my hands to cover my mouth, covering my mouth using my hands. The next time I will meet a person and start a handshake, my very hands is harboring the microorganisms. I will be able to transfer microorganisms through a handshake that is considered to be direct skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact. Common, um, uh, common mode of transferring microorganisms such as uh, the cold viruses and, well, COVID-19 for that matter. This is very prevalent mode of infection transfer, especially in the hospital, because we have this what you call high touch areas or high exposure areas wherein particularly your hands, this is usually uh, utilized in order to perform different nursing interventions. When you are dealing with your patients, you usually use your hands. That's why it's important for us healthcare providers, particularly their nurses, to always perform adequate, effective, efficient hand hygiene, uh, eliminating those microorganisms that might cause different disease condition because you might now be considered as a reservoir. Now, promoting cross-contamination even in the work field. That's why as per the recommendation of the Department of Health, despite you not having any microorganism that might cause a disease, once you sneeze, Part of our etiquette is you will cover your mouth using the antecubital space because your antecubital space, unlike your hand, is not considered high touch. Next will be direct mucous membrane to membrane contact. This is done through kissing or even sexual contact. Common mode of transfer for sexually transmitted disease is we're in through sex or sexual intercourse, there will be mucus from uh, the female cavity as well as the male uh, organ for copulation. It might transfer infection. Common for example of your STDs are your syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes, as well as uh, the transfer of HIV causing AIDS. You can also have an indirect contact through airborne, which was discussed a while ago, through droplet or even airborne, depending on the size of the molecule or the droplet nuclei. Well, this is important for you to understand as we 
uh, continue with our discussion that there are several ways on how to cut those uh, modes of transfer. Pero mamaya na natin siya bigyan ng pansin. You also have infection via food and contaminated water making the food preparation also our concern in hospitals because our food that we are serving our patients might even be sources of infection. Kaya dapat always beware on the manner they prepare and deliver and serve the food that your patients are about to take. Next is indirect contact through anthropods, basically your vectors. Also, you have indirect contact with fomites, such as res uh, well respirators. That's why oxygen cannula is not being utilized from one patient to the other because there are some microorganisms that are considered to be pathogen present in your nasal opening that might be transferred with, not, with repetitive use of the same nasal cannula. There are different uh, hospital instruments, hospital uh, devices that are considered to be disposable. Because of uh, this, infection is greatly reduced. However, not all uh, instruments can be disposed, such as your surgical instruments due to their cost. In order to limit infection, we should keep in mind, based from our previous discussion, effective way of disinfecting and sterilizing. In order to limit or even completely eradicate different microorganisms that might cause infection. Also, uh, through direct contact, as nurses, it's not just your hands that you need to keep clean at all times, but also your clothes. Because again, as per explained from our previous discussions, your clothes might also be a reservoir, meaning different microorganisms might attach to your clothes. And once that you have contact with your patient, aside from your hands, your clothes might expose them to different microbes. You now being the reason of cross-contamination. You also have indirect transfusions through contaminated blood and blood products. The main reason why uh, hospital nowadays seldom use uh, non-disposable or glass syringes. Mostly among hospitals, they are using uh, disposable syringes, one-time use only, because these syringes are considered to be sterile in order to prevent cross-contamination. Once utilized, you are not to use the same syringe every single time to prevent, again, contamination. Needle sharing is also not allowed because a lot of uh, diseases can be transferred through blood or what we call bloodborne, an example of which is your HIV. The common cause of transfer or spread of HIV, aside from sexual intercourse, will be sharing of needles, especially used by those persons abusing different substances. For example, well, this is not an example, but rather a true-to-life story, a particular testimony of a nurse working in an emergency room. There was this time that in order to prevent injury, the moment she saw a needle lying in the ground, she immediately picked it up. However, she was accidentally bumped by a co-worker. And now, uh, because of that accident, she suddenly pricked her finger with that particular needle. Now, upon being pricked by the needle, uh, sad to say, the needle was used by an HIV positive patient, meaning the needle possesses that particular virus. Unfortunately, that particular healthcare worker now have contracted HIV. That's the very main reason why we have strict protocols on how to dispose sharps and contaminated objects in the hospital. There are several strategies in order for us to do para maputol natin ang chain or break the chain of infection. Number one, if you will eliminate the source of infection or eliminate the reservoir, definitely, okay, it, the chain will be broken. However, sir, are you saying that we should kill human beings? No. What I mean is for substances such as your uh, non-living things, in order to eliminate the reservoir, dispose them. 
or if not possible, sterilize them. Next will be to prevent contact with different substances. What am I trying to say when we are preventing contact with different substances? That is the very main reason why you are instructed to, well, stay at home. Because if you remain at, in your houses during this pandemic, definitely you will not be in contact with anyone, thus breaking the chain of infection. Let's incorporate our previous learning from our previous discussions. Once viruses will not be able to find a new host to colonize, they will naturally die. That's why quarantine is one of the most effective ways on how we can stop this pandemic if truly indeed this is a virus. That is another topic for debate. You can also prevent infection through eliminating the modes of infection or the modes of transmission. For example, this COVID-19 is said to be transferred through droplets. That's why in order to prevent that particular droplet having contact with you, practice social distancing that will eliminate the mode of transmission. Aside from that, for example, the mode of transmission is through mucus to mucus contact. Well, avoid having sexual intercourse or avoid kissing or having contact with different mucous membranes in order to cut the mode of transmission. Next, block the entry pathway. Specifically for COVID-19, we have this what you call your T-zone. Your T-zone will be the zone between your eyes extending up until your mouth. That is your T-zone, said to be the most uh, uh, or the area where COVID-19 usually enters. That is the very main reason why we are to wear masks as well as face shield that will be able to cover that particular T-zone. Because again, COVID-19 virus or your SARS-CoV-2 usually enters through your mouth, through your nose, as well as through your eyes. Kaya dapat natin protectahan. Blocking the mode of entry or the portal of entry as well as portal of exit will be means of cutting the chain of infection. Oh, next will be to reduce or eliminate the host's susceptibility. How will you reduce or eliminate the host's susceptibility? Number one, strengthen your immunity. Eat well, rest well, and eat nutritious foods. Next is have enough sleep. Also, you can eliminate your susceptibility by injecting or by taking uh, immunization shots. The very main reason why it is advisable for you to have a yearly influenza vaccine. Another important consideration is for you to have proper hygiene. Well, typically for us healthcare workers, our priority is to uh, perform proper hand hygiene. But generally speaking, having an overall good hygiene will be effective in breaking and eliminating different microorganisms that we are harboring within our body. Next is having good nutrition, rest, and stress reduction, which will basically, as per explained, increases or boosts your immunity. In obtaining immunizations also uh, through uh, injection of live attenuated viruses or bacteria might produce immunity, making our body immune to that particular strain of a disease. For example, I myself, well, this is not immunization, however, it produced an immunity on my part. I have suffered dengue or was diagnosed with dengue a couple years back and because of that, I am immune to that particular strain of dengue. Uh, well, just uh, something that is nice to know. There are four strains of dengue and I had one. So basically, the other three strains of dengue might be able to uh, affect me. However, I'm 25% immune to dengue because thankfully, I've experienced dengue myself. Well, thankfully might not be the right term though. 
implement rodent and insect control, especially if the mode of transmission is through vehicles, particularly your vectors, your rodents, your insects, removing their site of or their breeding site or their where they proliferate will be the most effective way in order to cut the chain of infection. Common example of this is the elimination of stagnant water. The common uh, breeding sites for mosquitoes, the causative agent of your dengue as well as malaria. When we will kill the area wherein they will thrive, grow, and multiply, it will be an effective way in order for us to cut that chain, breaking the chain of infection, thus eliminating the possibility of contracting the disease. Next is proper patient isolation, which will be discussed later on. As per stated, different microorganisms might be transferred through fomites. That's why we should ensure proper decontamination as well as sterilization of our medical instrument. Back when I was working as a nurse in the OR, uh, it is our strict protocol that every single time we will have a patient in our theater, after the operation, we will perform environmental sanitation. Cleaning areas primarily, such as those areas that are considered to be high touch, high contact, that usually will have blood droplets. We will secure and make it sure that we will be able to clean it using our hospital-grade disinfectants. Also, we have our surgical instruments that are being subjected through sterilization process with the use of steam through autoclave. We also utilize, we also utilize different gases through our steroid as well as gas machine. All these modalities eliminate microorganisms present in our fomites. Next, dispose sharps and infectious waste properly. When you go to the hospital, there are specific beans uh, well dedicated, specially dedicated for sharps, for sharp objects in order to prevent accidents such as prick and punctures. You also have different disposal beans for infected uh, wastes. That's the very main reason. For example, you are taking care of a baby and suddenly uh, uh, he defecated and uh, fortunately you have him or her on diapers. However, once you are to change his the baby's diaper, you should make it uh, or you should secure that the diaper upon disposal is being sealed away because your fecal material might also harbor different microorganisms. That's why be careful when disposing sharps, especially the used ones, as well as infectious wastes. Next is for you to wear PPE appropriately. It's not a new thing for everybody to, or it's not a new term for everybody, the word PPE or your personal protective equipment, especially in our times wherein the pandemic COVID-19 is still lurking. PPEs are basically protective equipments that will protect you, the one who's wearing it, from the causative agent of a particular disease. Whenever necessary, you are to utilize this PPE at their utmost potential. Kaya dapat ginagamit natin to, depending on our client. Why depending on our client? We have different precautions that we will be presenting later on. However, if the patient does not have a communicable disease or, well, has a disease na might be transferred through contact only, why will you wear an N95 mask? That will be a little bit offensive to that particular patient or alarming to that particular patient given our current cytal conditions. Kaya dapat be, be aware, you should wear PPEs as prescribed and if needed. Next will be use needle safety during blood uh, collection because again, there are some diseases an example of which is your HIV or your AIDS that can be transferred through bloodborne contact. Kaya dapat, we should be careful and we will use uh, needle safety devices. Well, in a particular institution where I've worked, again as a nurse, 
during our IV line insertion or yung pagsiswero, we are using needle safety devices wherein you will not be able to be to prick yourself accidentally because it automatically locks. So those technologies prevent accidental pricking that might well result to a bloodborne transmission of diseases or transmission of bloodborne diseases rather. Ito naman yung mga precaution that we are using or that we are implementing in the hospital depending on the condition of your patient. Number one, if the condition of the patient is said to be transferred through droplet method, the following will be our provisions. We should let our patient stay on a private room or if not possible, in a ward as long as there is at least 2 meters distance from one patient to the other with of course, curtains covering one patient from another. For the staff nurse, you should always wear mask as well as eye protection. Ito yung standard precaution na ginagawa natin for COVID-19. As you can see, aside from the hazmat suit, okay, we are using mask and uh, uh, face mask and eye shield in order to prevent this droplet to enter from us. Also, if necessary for this patient to be transferred uh, from one place to the other or for him or her to be ambulated, once nalalabas sa kwarto ang pasyente, always make it sure that your patient is wearing a mask. This will not prevent the patient from contracting different microorganisms from the environment, but rather we are protecting the environment from your patient because your patient is a reservoir and having him uh, wear a mask will protect the rest of the community. This is the very main reason why earlier during our experience for COVID-19, it is not expected or advisable for us to wear masks because a lot of people does not know your proper mask etiquette or how to properly wear and handle your mask. However, okay, it is advised that for symptomatic patients that will experience common manifestations such as coughs, colds, they are required to put on mask because putting mask on them will be more productive than putting mask to everybody else because putting mask to your patient will limit the uh, causative agent na pag nilabas nila through droplet within sa mask lang hindi lalabas sa environment thus uh, breaking the chain of your infection if the patient uh, has someone with them, you are also to advise them to wear mask if they are to go outside. If the patient is said to have a contact precaution, meaning the patient's disease can be transferred through contact, ibig sabihin sa paghawak, okay? the following are the provisions. You are to ask your patient to stay on a private room. However, if not possible, pwede naman sa ward or a common room as long as they will be staying with patients with the same condition. Yun ang importante. Next, for staff such as us as well as other healthcare providers, it is important for you to always wear gown as well as gloves. What do, you, what do you mean when we wear gown and gloves? This is the very main reason why, kasi ngayon, uh, your COVID-19 disease is said to be transferred through a combination of droplet as well as contact. Kaya nga nagsusot tayo ng hazmat suit. Once we step out of an area where a patient is positive of that disease, we are to remove the gown as well as gloves because they are considered to be unsterile. There is a probability that your gown as well as your gloves harbors the disease causative, or the causative agent of the disease. Kaya tatanggalin. Mind you, a lot of people nowadays wears masks in order to prevent direct contact. That might be effective given you know the proper way on how to wear and how to handle your gloves. Because if you go out of the house, then you wore your gloves, then go from one place using your same gloves, you drive using your gloves, you, you fix your eyeglasses using your gloves. Well, it doesn't make sense because your gloves, well, there's no purpose unless you dispose it. If you have a contact in one person, remove 
discard, put another one. That's how you are to use your gloves. That's why it's considered to be disposable. Now, for your, for you, my future uh, healthcare providers, once you have contact with your clients, especially if they have discharges such as uh, mucus secretions, uh, blood, uh, oil, or sebaceous secretions, lahat yan are considered to be excretions and consider, might harbor microorganisms upon having contact. For example, the patient has a wound upon touching the wound or ha after uh, cleaning that particular area, before touching another area, discard. Now, if your patient does not have any obvious discharge before going to the patient's room, hand hygiene, do your gloving, then after contact with your patient before stepping out of the room, discard your gloves so that you will not be able to perform cross-contamination. Again, nurses, since you are one of the healthcare providers, you are the healthcare provider that has the most contact time with your patient. Make sure that your hands are always clean and that you are doing proper gloving. Uh, another is for you to wear your PPEs and dedicated equipment when doing several procedures. That is for your contact. Droplet plus contact was explained a while ago. It's basically the combination of both. Airborne, on the other hand, having the word itself, the disease can be transferred through air. Ibig sabihin, when you are in the patient's room, the entirety of the room is considered to be unsterile because the microorganism might float through the air. What are you to do now? Number one is for you to have a, a reverse isolation. When we say reverse, when we say isolation, we are protecting the patient from the outside environment. Commonly done for patients that are immunocompromised because they are easily uh, they easily contract disease. Kaya pinoprotektahan natin sila against microorganisms from the outside. However, these persons are now the carriers. We would like to protect the environment. That's why we are utilizing reverse isolation. Wherein we are close, always securing that the patient's doors uh, or the patient's room is closed and sealed. Also, we have uh, different uh, environmental filters inserted in their air conditioning unit that will filter the air inside the room, trapping the microorganism that might cause a disease. Also, that is what you call your negative pressure, wherein the pressure sucks in the uh, room's uh, environmental air and purifying the air that is what you call uh, negative pressure common for or theaters because we cannot risk infection in the operating room that's why we are installing hepa filters that will serve as negative pressure para ang air natin sinasak paloob at hindi lumalabas within the theater effectively preventing infection especially those that are considered to be airborne Next is for the staff. Since microorganisms can be transferred through air, we should utilize a good mask. What do I mean by that? We are utilizing surgical grade mask at least or even an N95 in order to appropriately and effectively block these microorganisms from entering our system. If the patient will have uh, another person with him or her uh, as a resident, you are to require them to wear mask when going outside of the room. This will again prevent the spread of infection, uh, protecting your environment from your infectious client. Now that we have talked about your chain of infection, your mode of transmission, well, uh, to further the discussion of your chain of infection after your mode of transmission, you have your portal of entry wherein these microorganisms will enter our body. Kaya usually protect your mucosal opening. That's the very main reason why you are using mask as well as face shield. After that, uh, after your portal of entry, the last will be the susceptible host, especially if your host is not or did not yet develop immunity against that particular pathogen, it is most likely that he or she will contract that disease. There are several organizations or groups that 
are responsible for epidemiology studies as well as preventing the spread of infection. Lagi nyong naririnig to, especially nowadays in news uh, and and different uh, uh, posts in social uh, on our social media. Number one will be your World Health Organization or WHO. This is a specialized agency in the United States responsible for international public health. The WHO's mandate is advocating universal health care, monitoring public health risk, coordinating responses to health emergencies, as well as promoting human health and well-being. It provides techniques, assistance to different countries, sets international health standards and guidelines, and collects data on a global health issue. Currently in our pandemic, you will remember that several members of the WHO is performing different press conferences, wherein they are giving advices uh, for all the countries that are suffering from the disease on how they are to handle, how they are to prepare, and how they are to treat clients that will be positive of that disease. The very main organization responsible for this is your WHO, basically based in the United States, however concerned in the welfare of every country, uh, well, or the welfare globally. Also have your Center for Disease Control and Prevention or your CDC wherein its main goal is to protect public health and safety through the control and prevention of disease, injury, disability uh, both in the U.S. as well as internationally. They specially focus their attention on infectious disease, foodborne pathogens, environmental health, occupational health, health promotion, injury, and educational activities designed to improve health. Both of these organizations are vital in our study of epidemiology. Well, in fact, here in our country, we have our National Epidemiology Center, which is, which is another uh, sub-branch of your Department of Health responsible for checking the prevalence and incidence of different diseases present in our country. Sila yung nagre-report every now and then that the current cases of this particular disease is this number. Sila yung responsible doon, the National Center for Epidemiology here in our country. This particular organization has laid several terms in order for us to understand. Number one is control of infectious disease. When they say we, ha we are currently controlling the infectious disease, they simply mean that they are doing something in order to reduce the incidence and prevalence of that particular disease. It's neither positive nor negative. Well, it's positive in a way that they are doing something. However, it's not conclusive that it is yet to be effective. Next will be the elimination of your infectious disease. When we say elimination, there's a reduction of case transmission to a predetermined low level. Example, if we say that there will be one case per million of uh, people all over the world that is infected by COVID-19, we can consider COVID-19 to be eliminated. Ibig sabihin, nagkakaroon ng predetermined value. And once we have reached that predetermined value, it can be said that we have eliminated the disease. However, it does not warranty complete eradication. Because when we say eradication of the infectious disease, this is achieving a status wherein no more case of that particular disease is discovered. Thus, no uh, intervention is still needed or is to be performed. Kasi nga, completely eradicated na ang disease condition. Hopefully, these are the very words that we are waiting in the near future. Ang sarap pakinggan that world. COVID-19 has been completely eradicated. Hopefully, near uh, in, our, in the near future, I hope COVID-19 will be completely eradicated and we will be able to go back to our new normal lives. To wrap our current discussion, we have focused on the word epidemiology as well as public health, wherein we started to define pathology versus your epidemiology. Pathology is responsible for the disease process and how it is being diagnosed and causes uh, debilitating physiological changes in your patient or in your host, 
While epidemiology is concerned about determining the frequency, distribution, as well as determinants of diseases. We have given or provided you the focus of epidemiology, namely the pathogen, susceptibility of the population, immunization, nutrition, sanitation, the location of your reservoir, as well as ways of disease transmission. We have defined several terms. We started with infectious disease. Ibig sabihin, any disease condition brought about by pathogenic infection. You have communicable disease, an infectious disease that can be transferred from one person to the other. While contagious disease is a disease condition that is highly communicable. Zoonotic disease, on the other hand, was also defined wherein it is a disease condition brought about or having an animal as a reservoir. We've also defined your incidence versus your prevalence. Your incidence is the newly diagnosed case, while your prevalence is your total number of cases. We've differentiated morbidity rate versus mortality rate. Morbidity rate is simply the incidence rate expressed in a, uh, in a specifically defined population, while mortality rate is the ratio of the number of deaths in accordance to the population. However, both are not conclusive on how deadly or fatal is the disease. We need to find out the case fatality rate, which is basically uh, the number of deaths that occurred to the num versus the number of persons diagnosed with that particular disease condition. Also, we have classified our diseases depending on the number of being affected and the area wherein they are uh, considered to be present. You have your sporadic, which means occasional. At times, it's present. At times, it's not. You have your endemic. It's always present. However, it's fluctuating. There are days that the infection is rampant and there are days that the infection is at minimal level. However, an important consideration is that it never goes away. Your epidemic disease, on the other hand, is there is a condition wherein there is a greater than usual number of cases in a particular area. Dumadami bigla ang mga taong affected by that particular disease. And when this is well spread and not only regionalized, meaning it is all over the world affecting multiple countries, it is now considered to be pandemic. There are several factors that we have also presented. You have your pathogenic factor, your host factor, and your environmental factor, all of which contributes to how disease or how infection disease uh, are being manifested and transferred from one person to the other. We have also talked about your chain of infection wherein we stated that there should be the presence of your pathogen that will require a reservoir either a living or a non-living reservoir. After that, they should have a port of exit, exiting your uh, reservoir to the outside environment and having several modes of transmission, such as your droplet, airborne, vehicular, as well as direct skin-to-skin -skin contact or direct contact for that matter. We have also presented several strategies in order for us to stop the spread and cut the chain of infection. And lastly, to cap our discussion, we have defined three terms. Controlling disease, meaning there is a current intervention. Elimination of a disease is wherein we have achieved a pre-established goal as our parameter that indeed a particular disease is considered to be eliminated and eradication of the disease which is the complete eradication or termination or complete uh, uh, eradication well eradication is the only word that i can think of complete eradication of our causative agent uh, rendering us to have no further interventions because again the problem is completely resolved now that you are equipped with the right attitude as well as right thinking when it comes to uh, infectious diseases and how they are being transferred from one person to the other, I would like to hope that the fear of this current pandemic will be eliminated and it will be changed in how you are to behave or to react given the changes in our society.
This is again Jonas, hoping that all of you are all well despite the extended quarantine. Wishing you all and saying that learning should always be a fun experience.